Pretty much close, but yeah. No, I'm not So tonight we're going to have a bit of news about the association and also um, some general space news by the North region. Um, it's going to be a bit more extended. The reason being is unfortunately due to the uh, flood situation up in Queensland, and our feature speaker, Michael Smart from Hypersonics Launch Systems, uh, their inter his internet uh, connection has become extremely unstable. Uh, and so therefore does not feel confident that he's able to present online through the Zoom system which we're going to use. So unfortunately he's going to have to, he's had to pull out and send his apologies. We send our apologies to, to you and once again, hope Michael will be up there safe. So we're going to hopefully have Michael back um, at some point in the future. Never mind, there's still plenty of space news to contend with. So, uh, the good thing about it is it'll give us extra time to speak to our favourite space association member, well, one of the favourites, there's a lot of favourites, uh, Vivian Tran, uh, Vienna Tran, I should say. Uh, she's joining us from South Australia. I think she's South Australia. Yeah. So she, uh, people may recall back in June of 2020, I believe it was, she gave us a presentation on her um, study and the final results of that study are now in. So she's uh, back to tell us all about that. And then we're going to have a bit of a break, have a chat, have a drink, whatever. And then we're going to end Rennie back in, in the house, giving us a plan to the exploration of space science update. And hopefully it will give us a detailed update on the James Webb Space Telescope. I haven't had a chance to confirm that we need to work more with the work area. And then we'll wrap it up about 9.30 tonight and um, we'll think about next month. So for those who are not familiar, the Space Association runs a weekly radio show called The Space Show. And that's on a radio station, 88.3 Southern FM, it's also a live stream and um, podcast. And uh, here's a recent picture of people listening to the podcast. I like that picture. Um, yeah, we spoke about last month, we're going to be... Uh, sending out a, a survey to the membership uh, just to find out what uh, what you'd like us to do, what you'd be willing to do, and uh, what which direction you know, you'd like us to move into. So we still have to finalise the structure that uh, we're working on it, um, and we hope we will have that sent out in March. Um, the idea being we'll get an idea of what you like, what you don't like, what you want to see more, what you see, what you see less of. Probably less of me talking is probably a good start on that. Um, so yeah. And the results back from that. So once again, keep it on your email. We're going to review review the uh, results of that survey, have a discussion about that, and what that means for the association, what we do, who we, who we focus on, what we focus on doing as an organisation, um, and uh, hopefully we'll feed into the into the, um, the year going forward, and we'll table those results. Um, within the committee and then the committee will come back with recommendations based on that uh, at our AGM, which at this stage we're looking at doing in, in April of this year. So um, we'll keep an update on all of that. The AGM, we, as people are not familiar, anyone's a member um, is more than welcome to, uh, to come to the meeting. We have other people come to the meeting as well, a bit to observe. You also able to nominate for uh, positions on the committee and um, suggestions about what we do going forward. Someone's again, if you're a member of the group of the association, thanks for being a member. If you're not a member, we'd love to have you. If you're a last member, come back. We want, we love you. We want you back. We love you in the in the Donald, Donald Trump sense. <laughs> we love you. You're very special. Okay, we need my apology for that next month. Um, so we're here at the Gold Gate Hotel in South Melbourne for those that aren't here. And if you're in Melbourne any time, first night of the month, you're more than welcome to come down and have a drink, come to the meetings. Next meeting will be the 20th of March, and the rest of the meetings, as you can see on the screen, the exception to that formula being the December meeting, which we'll be talking to earlier. Right, and the next month, uh, but amongst other things, we're probably going to be looking at the uh, rollout. Actually, probably won't happen the next month. Uh, but what well, well, would have happened the next month? The rollout of the SMS block. Uh, so we're going to have a bit of news about that as well. 
So I'm going to get started with some space news, Australian space news. And um, there's quite a lot going on, so I'll just sort of skip over a bit of it for you. So the project Rainbow Python sounds like Riley. Is it water we can? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We thought about it. And, I mean, it might be people might be more inclined to come on. Yeah, people might be less inclined to come on. The situation is we've got this arranged here with the venue and to change all around based on a lot of unknowns like is it going to affect anybody? I don't know. I mean, given the demographic of us, we're probably all the time, you know, most of us. Yeah. Well, we've got a truck game here, that might be a much. There you go. Bit of, bit of fun. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, point taken. Yeah, we've got to have a chat about that. Um, so this is a Sydney based company, Spiral Blue. I've never heard of them, but they're around. Uh, with Esther Space Imagery and Dandelions. Uh, they've been awarded a fund from this advanced manufacturing growth center commercialization fund, which I believe is something for the department of government. Um, so uh, uh, they've got a bunch of money that they've assigned to stimulate manufacturing in Australia. Uh, so the University of New South Wales and Save Astronautics up in Sydney, um, uh, providing testing facilities and access to space systems, etc. Save astronautics for those that don't know, we can provide mission operations and pre launch engineering support. But they're quite an active little business. They do a lot of business in the US and other uh, places as well. So that'd be interesting. Uh, part of what they're going to be doing is uh, two separate payloads launched on Space Machine Company's Optimus platform. And, and these will basically be. Uh, Experiments on a a, a, um, a CubeSat chip or a so car. So there's a lot of content that can be put on these cars and connected up to the bus system of this of the CubeSat and do a lot of science. So that's what they're planning to do. So that's um, the, the recipient of this uh, Australian Space Agency Move to Mars Supply Chain Capability Improvement Grant. I'm just going to move this a little bit. Yeah. The audio it's too is. close. Sorry, bro. Sorry, I'm just going to put this one here. Right, so there you go. So the grant supported, uh, most of it, yeah, supporting the development of Spiral Blue's Space Edge Services platform. So, sounds very interesting. Um, Julian, are you ready to go soon? Because I'll be passing to you at the moment. Um, Julian is one of our members. Um, so, Perth celebrated the 60 years since John Glenn uh, orbited the Earth. And no, he wasn't the first person to orbit the Earth. He was the first American to orbit the Earth. Our friend Yuri was the first. So, back in February 20, uh, 1962, John Glenn uh, orbited the Earth in his completed seven capsule. And um, he took particular note of uh, one of the city's uh, lights as he flew over Western Australia. So what they'd done is they'd uh, decided that they, because the flypath was over Perth, they were going to turn on, on the lights in the city. So he clearly made comment about the fact that it was uh, very bright and said thanks to Perth and Rockingham uh, for doing that. Um, so yeah, so it got nicknamed the City of Lights. And, uh, there was a celebration this week, and um, so Perth Airport uh, um, put on a, a, a light show on their control tower there, working with local artists. Um, so it was a two minute animation, and there was a bunch of other things. And Julian, our member, one of our members over in West Australia, was nearby and was able to uh, tell us all about it. Um, now, some of the stuff on the graphics was a bit of artistic license, like John didn't. Why the Saturn V? He didn't do a spacewalk, but it's okay. It's space, and they were happy with that. So everything space is good. Um, there was also a drone show as well. So Julian, if you're there, I will hand over to you. And I believe Julian's got a couple of slides and a little video, which I'm not sure how it will go. So Ashley, I'll just uh, stop sharing and let Julian go ahead. Oh, there he is. Yep, hey. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, you're uh, almost... I'm getting my phone screen here. Stand by, Julian. Are you sharing your screen, Julian? No, not yet. Okay, go ahead and share. Okay, you should see me now. Maybe. Yep. Yep, it's not in full presentation mode, but yeah, we've got you. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Pete. But um, what you've covered almost is identical to what I've got already. <laughs> but that's that's all good. I'll um, I'll go into slide mode and see if that will help out. Uh, let me move you around. So yeah, this is Perth, the city of lights, the drone show. Um, well, as Pete already touched on it, um, the City of Light drone shows commemorated the 60 years of John Glenn um, historic flight, orbiting three times around the Earth in 62. Um, can you still see it okay? Because I'm moving this little box around. Yeah, it's all good. Okay. Um, oh, that's even better. I've got rid of it. Um, so yeah, Perth residents and businesses we're asked to leave the lights on, shine torches, do whatever they can to uh, generate as much light as possible. I managed to dig out a couple of old historic pictures. Uh, you can see your father and son, they were putting bed sheets up on the old hills hoist, making it into a big reflector. And um, you can also see the, the pathway of how the first orbit went very close to Perth, Mouche. And um, as Pete already mentioned in his slide, when he saw Rockingham and Perth, uh, therefore Perth uh, was dubbed the City of Lights. Um, over 300 drones were used for a 15 minute show, um, displaying an almost compulsory cultural theme. And of course, why we were called the City of Lights uh, by displaying an astronaut and Unfortunately, they showed an Apollo capsule instead of the Mercury capsule. Um, Perth Airport also did a two minute uh, display on their control tower. And it was just doing a Saturn V rather than a Mercury uh, rocket. And again, the asteroid, I think is Apollo related as well. Um, Perth also took the opportunity to um, adapt a new logo. It still keeps its official crest, but now you'll see that on a lot of letterheads, um, it will have this city of Perth with the, with the circles. Uh, unfortunately, with this PowerPoint presentation, it came up on a dark background, but the, the inner circle represents the light, and the next circle is your beach, uh, the red dirt, green grass, and then the sky. So they're gonna use this now um, to promote Perth as the city of lights. I've got a small video here. Hopefully it will work. Um, the first 10 minutes, it will, um, it will show you the actual show. So just bear with me. Oh, don't tell me you blocked it because I worked the other day. I don't know if there's any, I don't think there's any sign to it, but as you can see, you've got the, the ash tree down, sorry, Elizabeth Key down the bottom here, and then up the top, you've got the drones. Uh, 
That's great. It gets better. And I'll see if there's any. There we go. And now, just like that. 
that historic night in 1962, it's our turn. Grab your phone, turn your light on, and shine it towards the spacecraft up above. Just like 60 years ago, Perth, again, a city united. And, and you know, we, might, uh, we might finish it there. It's yeah. good. If you see the link in the, uh, the chat section of the Zoom, that'd be great. It's a bit, a bit chunky, chunky here, so thanks. We really appreciate that. You got any more slides or anything? No, that's, that's it. All right. Thanks. We really appreciate it. See you, see you soon. Yeah, no worries. Um, also, um, there's another announcement. Hang on, let me get rid of it. Apparently, um, oh, where is it? Goonie Hill Earth Station are building a ground station that aids Earth to space communication. Um, and I've got a picture of it down here. Apparently, Goonhilly Earth Station. And they've got, they're based in the UK. Um, yeah. So this one is in Cornwall in the UK. So now they're going to build in WA as well. I'm actually talking to one of the guys via LinkedIn and I'm going to get more information on this. Well, I'm hoping to get that one next month. Yeah. I'll see what I stop sharing. We'll get back to the rest of me. Thanks, appreciate it, mate. Yep, no worries. I've stopped sharing. That's in the 24th, on the 24th of March. So this is just a bit of cut based from their spiel about the market and what they're doing. Um, so that's on the 24th up in Sydney at the Star Casino. Just go up there, double your money, it's all good. And, uh, and then immediately after that, in the evening, they've got, they've got, they've got the Australian Space Awards. Uh, so it'll be in the evening from 7 p.m. So uh, it'll be interesting to watch who goes there and what gets done there. They used to have a, uh, a category for non-profit sort of outreach groups, etc. And I thought, Giddy, we're going to nominate the association for that, but they're not doing it this year. So. Oh, anyway. Um, so some other strange space news. Uh, apparently, we're going to be sending an astronaut to space under this new <coughs> election year. Um, commitment by the Australian government. $65 million plan announced last Friday. So yes, the idea is to be able to triple the size of the space industry by 2030. Um, and this is a quote from Scotty from Marketing, uh, our glorious Prime Minister, uh, Australian space, in, uh, sending an Australian space in serious investment in local jobs, local technologies and local businesses. So. Um, I've already sent my application in, so uh, we'll see what happens. 
So the $65 million will invest in launching homegrown rockets, spacecraft, and astronauts. Astronauts, it says, there you go, the money. So many of the other members of the association. Uh, so this is going to be helping to further advance the existing spaceports and infrastructure we've got here. Um, so the new spaceports, uh, so there are, I think, three. There's uh, Sudden Launch uh, in South Australia. There's uh, Equatorial Launch up in, in Northern Territory and also Queensland. They've got one. Yeah, at least one. Um, so yeah, watch this space. So $32.5 million will be invested into Kerber space flights in Australia, three and a half million funding at the National Student Space Channel. So there we go. All right, so that's just a little wrap up of Australian space. There's a lot more there, but I, I did I sort of stripped out a lot because I didn't think we're going to have so much time. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to note that the money that's been announced. It's interesting to note that the money that's been announced does not include actually putting an astronaut in space. It's, it's only to investigate. <laughs> to so the election. To, yeah, yeah, to investigate doing so and to negotiate with possible overseas partners who could actually put the astronaut in space. And, the, and another thing is the announcement said Australians back in space. Well, we've never had an Australian in space, other than that uh, guy who went up on the on, on the New Shepard, um, because they've been Americans at the time they flew. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. You've always got to read the fine print on these things, especially in election year. All right, so it's got a bit of global space news. That's our good man Pete Conrad there. Sadly, he's been gone for a number of years. Um, so obviously the big news uh, around uh, this week and recently has been the Ukraine uh, invasion uh, by Russia. So we've got a little couple of slides here on what that might possibly mean for the space sector, given that we're a space group. So, so uh, US and Russia have long been partners at the ISS, but the, the position of that and how that works with the um, on ongoing, ongoing cooperation is a little bit unknown. We've had other uh, issues between Russia and the US. You know, in fact, for example, a while ago when the, um, with the Crimea and things like that, but it sort of carried on regardless. But uh, NASA said in a statement that uh, they continue to work with all their international partners, including Roscosmos, for the ongoing safe operations of the ISS. Uh, so there are seven people up there at the moment, five. Uh, uh, Five US astronauts. Five astronauts. Five astronauts. Four American and one German. And two cosmonauts. Ah, that's right. Yeah. I should read my thing. Yeah, so five and two makes sense. Fantastic. And all of us were three Titan We're a tenant space. So he announced the uh, Biden announced why reaching economic sanctions against Russia. Now, obviously, this is changing day by day, hour by hour almost, but this is as of last Thursday. So he's um, specifically mentioned that the Penrose will degrade aerospace industry, including space program uh, impact. So that's a bit interesting. A bit of a clarification later on from NASA. New export control measures will continue to allow US-Russia civil space cooperation. No changes are planned to the agency support for ongoing in orbit and ground space operations. So they're coming, trying to cover themselves there. Uh, so NASA has pledged that the sanction will not impact the civil space program. Director General of Roscosmos, Dmitry Rogozin, said in a tweet, a Twitter thread on them, that the nation was acting like an irresponsible gamer and should consider it Alzheimer's reactions, uh, sanctions, etc. Uh, press conference on the 25th, by once again, uh, will degrade Australian uh, aerospace industry, including space program, and part of their ability to build ships and producing their ability to compete economically. It would be a major hit to put them on the trend and ambitions. 
So his uh, remarks didn't detail how the US sanction would impact the Russian space sector directly. Was was must acted quickly in a series of tweets. Rogozin, he must have been late at night on his um, vodka. Uh, so he questions US motives, etc. Uh, do you want to destroy our cooperation on the ISS, or do you want to manage it by yourself? So, interesting. Um, so you rush, Russia and Ukraine do play major roles in the global space industry, both buying and selling everything from rockets to spacecraft components. And the US companies also manufacture in Ukraine, which uh, probably a lot of people here did know. Northrop Grumman's and Terry's rocket. Um, the first stage of the Antares is built and assembled in Ukraine, and the rocket is powered by a Russian built RD 180 engine. So that could be a real impact to what's going on. Nine years, uh, the US relied solely on Russia to supply astronauts up and down to the space station because the shuttle had finished flying and the commercial uh, crew transfer system hadn't got anything up and running. However, back in 2020, SpaceX finally got their Crew Dragon operational and that's been running quite successfully. Um, they have been working on the grim to have a Russian cosmonaut uh, fly on the Crew 5 mission at the second half of this year. So what happens with that? We don't know. Hopefully we'll just keep going. Um, blaming European sanctions, the Russian space agency said it was recalling dozens of engineers and technicians from French Guiana while sus and suspending Soyuz rocket operations down there. So They've got this partnership in, in French Guiana uh, to, to run um, this European run spaceport to run Soyuz missions out of there at the Guiana Space Center. Russian teams were preparing a Soyuz rocket and frigate upper stage for April 5th launch from the spaceport. In response to EU sanctions against our enterprises, Ross Cosmos is suspending cooperation with European partners in organizing space launches from Karu Cosmodrome, withdrawing its technical personnel, including the Consolidated Launch Group in French Guiana. So that uh, a bit of uh, impact. So uh, China claims, and we spoke last month, I think we spoke last month about the fact that well, we forecast that a SpaceX rocket was going to hit the far side of the moon uh, on the 24th of February, I think it was. Uh, sorry, 24th of March, but uh, oh, 4th of March, I think it was. Uh, but it turns out that it wasn't that, but uh, they said that it was, it was a Chinese rocket, the Chang'e 5 T1 uh, stage from that. However, China said uh, it ain't ours. Um, so, according to the China Monitor, the upper stage of the rocket uh, related to that mission entered the atmosphere and completely burned up on the 21st of February, the statement said. First thought to be the upper stage of SpaceX. Falcon 9 rocket. Uh, it was then tagged as a leftover launch from China's Chang'e 5 mission. Uh, and David Gray reported January 1st that it was predicted to, this object was predicted to impact the moon on March 4. So the space tracking data from the US Space Force's 18th Space Patrol Squadron suggests that the rocket in question re entered, the one we're talking about, the Chinese one, in October 2015. Uh, so that apparently backs China's claim. And that was the, uh, that was the payload that got a, a sample back from the moon. <clears throat> the claim adds more mystery to the event that has captured widespread attention. So we don't know what it is exactly. So I guess we'll find out. So Tony Nanaset aims to spot volcanic eruptions from space before they happen. This is really interesting. I don't know how this is going to work. So the Nachos <laughs> blew a to space aboard the 17th Cygnus supply mission on the uh, February 19th. And a new sensor aims to uh, send information about volcanic, volcanic activity and air quality. Uh, so the Nanoset Atmospheric Chemistry Hyperspectral Observation System, I think they came up with an acronym and then worked out words to put to it, but anyway. Uh, we roughly 480 kilometers in altitude above the Earth's scanning the ground using hyperspectral imager. And um, it'll be deployed in late May as the Cygnus departs the orbiting complex. So, as people probably saw, uh, the, there's been observations before about a volcanic eruption. This was back in 2015 
uh, sorry, January 15th of this year of the uh, of the Tonga uh, volcanic eruption. So this is um, obviously visible from space. So it's interesting to see how these things are going to predict these things or anticipate them. Um, man, oh man, to have some money, this bloke. Uh, so this Bean is Palaz program will fly three missions on SpaceX Dragon and also Starship. So this Jared Isaacman, who, uh, who flew and also the mission um, uh, a while ago on the Inspiration 4, announced his Palaz program. So he's planning a trio of missions uh, using existing Dragon as soon as November and December or December this year. And that will culminate in um, a spacewalk. And then there will also be a space, the Starship mission uh, in the years to come. So they endeavoured to achieve the highest Earth orbit ever flown. Uh, that record is currently set at 1,373 kilometres by Jimmy 11 with Pete Conrad and uh, Dick Gordon back in 66. And here's uh, Dick having his spacewalk. Um, so this one will have um, a spacewalk at the front of the spacecraft. So it's going to be interesting. Um, so it'll be, I don't think the spacewalk will be at the peak altitude, but the spacewalk will come back lower, but they'll be up in the Van Allen belts uh, quite a bit for this particular, and they get up that high, but they'll reduce it back down, I think, to do that. Once they're back in the lower orbit, um, at least two of the crew members will do a spacewalk. Uh, so they'll have an airlock on that SpaceX Dragon, Crew Dragon, so there's a kind of depressurize the whole vehicle, which is what they did in the Gemini and Apollo missions. Gemini, Gemini, sorry, Gemini. I'm catering to all flavors, all right, here. I'm a, I'm a non-specific. <laughs> Half of them say Gemini, some say Gemini. Um, so the EDA will wear a new SpaceX designed spacesuit. So uh, obviously they won't be having their minds, they just have the, uh, uh, the, the, all the missions will be an EPA suit, so it'll be a whole new challenge as well. So then they're going to eventually fly uh, in a starship. Um, so they can have another sort of dragon, crew dragon mission, and then this third one will be the first human space flight of the starship. Uh, designed to carry both crew and cargo. Uh, but they're going to do lots of testing before they get on the wings, which is fair enough. All right, so we're going to do a bit of an update on the Artemis uh, program, and particularly Artemis 1, because that's hopefully flying this year. So this is the um, big US NASA program to, um, to get people back to the moon, the first woman, the first person of colour, uh, et cetera, on the moon, et cetera. So this is the sort of plan for the Artemis 1 mission. Essentially, it'll be like an Apollo 8 type of thing where they um, go off and go into, uh, they go into lunar orbit, don't they? Yeah. I think um, Yeah. So the update, so basically they've stacked the whole vehicle in the vehicle assembly building on the mobile launcher. And they're planning to roll the stack out to the battle, start the roll at uh, 9 a.m. on March 18th, that's Victorian or Melbourne time, uh, prior to the full test of the uncrewed flight. So it'll take about 12 hours to get out there, they don't go particularly fast. Uh, the actual late launch date is uh, undetermined at this point, it's going to be determined on how, how the, um, they're estimating that each launch cost about a billion dollars. So, um, but I think they've already started building hardware for under two and three. So they've done a fair bit of progress on those. So I'm not sure what they do when they run out of shuttle engines, but anyway. Um, so during the test, the launch pad engineers will be on duty at the launch control center and they'll work through uh, during an artist once one launch. They'll do a wet dress rehearsal. Uh, they'll capture as much data as possible, et cetera, et cetera. The wet dress rehearsal will basically be everything except launching. So they fuel it up, do all their tests, run all the connections, run all the uh, diagnostics, et cetera, check all the pressures, temperatures, make sure nothing's leaking, all that kind of stuff. And then they will detank 
and analyze the whole performance of all the systems, ground systems and onboard systems. And then they'll rip it all apart and roll it, well, won't rip it apart, but disconnect it and roll it back to the vehicle assembly building. Um, so this capsule, that, I'm not sure it's actually the same, same physical capsule, but the Orion capsule has flown before. It's thought of Delta Heavy in 2014. Um, um, I'm to the atmosphere. So we'll see. So the, um, they've released like a, a schedule of flight windows, and it's a little bit sort of complicated, but uh, basically there's the no-go, to achieve the objectives, there's no-go times, which is the red days of launch. The green days, uh, when they can achieve it uh, on a longer mission, and the light green ones are when they can achieve all the objectives on a shorter mission. So these are the dates that they've got, and it's all about all the mechanics, lighting on the launch, uh, day, the entry in orbit or in space around the moon, all that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, so that's kind of where we're at. So, obviously, uh, March, well, we're going to roll that March, we're not be launching March. So, they're talking about rolling it out, being out there for about two or three weeks, rolling it back, and probably being in the VAB for another two or three weeks, rolling it back out. Um, so, they're looking probably, probably. Um, April, probably, more likely May at this stage. And that's assuming nothing goes wrong, because I think they don't want any big no goes. So the window's there, May 7 to 21, June 6 to 16, and June 29 to July 12. So, yeah, they're saying those two later dates, June, end of June, July, are more likely to date. So we'll see. As it happens, I happen to have some annual leave up my sleeve and I've got most of those dates off. So if all the ducks are lined, I might actually get over and watch the damn thing. So I'll uh, update you as we get closer. So once again, unfortunately, uh, we are unable to have Michael Smart. And so I'm not sure is Vivian uh, online. She is. Are you nearly ready to hand over, Vivian? I'll do a quick introduction to you. Um, so Vivian, Vivian Tran is a space medicine researcher who's investigated the use of artificial gravity for the hip muscles of astronauts doing prolonged bed rest analog. She holds a first class honors degree from the University of Adelaide and gives public lectures, et cetera, talks. She also writes for spaceaustralia.com. And she also presented to us back in June of uh, 2020. So I've been very lucky. I've been able to get some um, advanced video of uh, one of Vivian's tests. So she's, she doesn't know I've got this. So I hope I haven't broken any confidences. But uh, this was one of the last tests that happened. Yes, sorry about that again. I couldn't help myself. Um, sorry about your dinner, Jess, <laughs> ladies. Um, all right, I'm going to uh, hand over to Vivian and I'll stop my sharing.
my talk. No spoilers. Um, so as Peter said, I was, um, I have been a presenter on here before around June 2020, and I only had the initial results of my study then. And a few things have happened since then. I graduated from that honours degree, and that's a picture of me graduating, uh, standing in front of a quote by our beloved Andy Thomas, South Australian astronaut. The quote is there on one of the main university buildings, and it says, I carried a dream. I was able to turn that dream into a real ambition, which ultimately took me to space. So I thought that was a very symbolic little picture. I worked for the space agency as a project officer and helped advise uh, the development of the roadmap for the applied space medicine and life sciences. And I've started working as a medical doctor full time time in hospital. So that's been a lot of fun. So it's probably not news to all of you as space enthusiasts, but the muscles degrade in space. This is concerning. On the left here, we have a fun gif of an astronaut actually on the moon falling over. And there's probably a few reasons for that. The astronaut has a very bulky suit that doesn't allow full range of mov mo motion of the joints. And the astronaut has spent a number of days in space. So um, it's pr he's probably not used to standing up on a gravity field. And on the right, we have Chris Hadfield, the astronaut, in a neutral buoyancy position with his hips and knees flexed on the International Space Station. This is the position that um, astronauts are in when they're not hooked to anything or Velcro to anything. They just don't stand up. As you can see here, his hips aren't being used, his knees aren't being used. It's pretty neutral, like if you were floating in the water. I'd just like to show you a video of Scott, um, um, one of the astronauts, spending landing. a year on the space station, so we were both involved in experiments to understand better how to keep people alive for longer periods of time in space. You start doing this right when you get out of the capsule. You know, the idea is to measure your performance right when you get out of the vehicle. Let's say you landed on Mars to try to understand what your physical capability is. You walk with your eyes closed, like foot to foot, which is hard even when you haven't been in space for a year, especially on this uneven ground of Kazakhstan. You get in an airplane, an airplane flies to Norway, and you do it there. And then it gets back to Houston, and you do them here again before you even get to go home. You're doing these tests for weeks. When do I do this again? Uh, Wednesday. What, like in two days, Wednesday? Yes. Man. Eventually, you're doing them once a month. And it's a couple days every six months, which is where I'm at right now. What, what is this test measuring? What, this? Yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so you could see that Scott Kelly, when he got back to Earth, was not having a very good time standing up and mobilising as a normal person would. So we can all agree this is concerning. If there's nothing that you take away from this presentation, take this away. If you don't use it, you lose it, right? If you don't use it, you lose it. When you stand in Earth's gravity, you are subject to 1G of force. The Z in that uh, caption there is to do with the direction of the force, so it's from head to toe. And we use our weight-bearing muscles to keep us upright. We're using them as we as we speak, when we're sitting and standing and, and doing all sorts of things. And I was looking specifically at the gluteal muscles, which are in our behind, in the hip. In space, we can see this astronaut is also in a neutral buoyancy position. There's a decreased axial loading, so those hips don't work as much. And 
the current protocols of exercise that the astronauts do on the space station, whether that be cardiovascular or resistance, resistance exercise, is not sufficient to mitigate the muscle losses that are experienced. It's important to note that the glutes are not just the glutes. There are three different muscles within the hip girdle, the gluteus maximus, medius and minimus. And importantly, they all have different structures and different functions, as you can see there in these exercises. So when we study the gluteal muscles, I think it's very important to study them separately rather than together, to isolate each muscle and see which one is doing what within a function. So I liken this to, to something a little bit more every day. So the other day I tried to connect my VCR player from the 90s to a modern television. Now everyone's got a VCR player, I'm sure. And to figure out how it, how it plays and how it works, I have to isolate each component along the chain between the VCR player and the television. Um, this is called fault, find, fault finding, and we do this because we want to see what the problem really is rather than testing the system as a whole. And that's, that's why we test the gluteal muscle separately. We can measure gluteal muscle deconditioning or weakening in a number of ways. We can image them and look for muscle atrophy or decrease in size. Um, this is because when we don't have any neuromuscular input into the muscles, then the, the rate at which the proteins are built in the muscle is less than the rate at which they are broken down. So there's a net protein degradation ending up in smaller muscle fibers. So muscle size is pretty, pretty self-explanatory, but we can also look at the fat within the muscle, also known as the intramuscular lipid concentration or ILC. I'm just going to call it fatty muscles for the minute. And you can see that, that there's two different subjects in, that, um, in, in those images. One of them at the top is a healthy, younger, fitter person with minimal fat within their muscles. There's less white within the gluteal muscles there compared with the greater number of white pixels within this image, the gluteal muscles showing this person is, they're probably older, they are more sedentary and weaker. ILC has been shown to correlate with function and strength. So it's important to analyze the fat within the muscle too. And so how do we test this in, to, in the context of space medicine? We have bed rest studies. We can lie a person in bed for a prolonged period of time, so for example, 60 days, and they do that because it simulates the effect that microgravity has on the entire body because it decreases that axial loading. And artificial gravity via a short arm centrifuge, as you can see here, has been proposed to be a good treatment or a way to mitigate the losses induced by microgravity. So um, this is a picture of the artificial gravity centrifuge that we used. Importantly, this study addresses a knowledge gap. Only one study previously has looked at the individual gluteal muscles in bed rest, and no studies have ever looked at the effects of artificial gravity on the gluteal muscles during a bed rest analog study. So what were the aims of the study? The first aim was to look at whether bed rest induces muscle atrophy and increased fat accumulation in the gluteal muscles. And the second aim was to see whether artificial gravity mitigated those losses. Here's how the study was designed. We recruited 24 healthy participants to lie in bed for 60 days. At baseline, they didn't have many differences between their gluteal muscles, whether they were male or female or regardless of their age. They were pretty fit and healthy. Before they lay in bed, we put them through a baseline data collection, BDC, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. So their hips were imaged in slices. And then they split into three groups. The first group had no artificial gravity at all and stayed in bed for the whole 60 days. And just by the way, this bed rest study means that they do all their hygiene and all their activities and their eating and drinking in bed. They must not get out of bed for two entire months. The second group had a continuous bout of 30 minutes artificial gravity at 1G, which is the same as what you'd be um, feeling if you were standing upright on earth. 
And then the third group had six five minute bouts to allow for recovery between spinning. And then at the end of the bed rest study, they were MRI again to compare the before and after. And this is where I come in. I was on the receiving end of all of these images, all of these MRIs from the participants. And to give you an idea of the scale of this data analysis, every participant had about 30 slices done of their entire hip. There were three muscles to analyze and I had to do them for both sides. And there were two sessions before and after, and there were 24 subjects. My job was to actually use MATLAB, which is a program to manually segment or outline what my eyes thought were the muscles. And I had a pretty good idea of where the muscles were um, throughout the hip. And so in total, I analyzed over 8,000 MRI slices. So what were the results of this study? Well, it should be pretty self-explanatory that bed rest induces muscle atrophy. I promise there would only be two slides of graphs. So um, hopefully I'll be able to take you through this as quick as I can. This is, for example, the gluteus maximus, and we're measuring the volume here in cubic centimeters. We can see if we just focus just on the solid squares and we can see that they have been split into three different groups, the control, continuous artificial gravity and intermittent artificial gravity. We can see that, of course, the volume of the gluteus maximus decreased over time. You can see that quite clearly, and we can see that with the other gluteus muscle, the gluteus medius and gluteus minimus. So what does that tell us? The bed rest induced muscle atrophy, the volume decreased over time. But what about the artificial gravity? Well, you can see that regardless of which group a participant was in, whether they had artificial gravity or not, they induced that they underwent the same amount of atrophy across the board. So artificial gravity didn't mitigate the amount of loss that they received. And what about the fat accumulation? So again, we have gluteus maximus and we measured the fat in terms of the fat water ratio. So when I outlined those muscles on the MRI image, um, the MATLAB program automatically calculated which pixels were white and which pixels were black and white means fat. So there was an accumulation of fat over time of the gluteus maximus, as well as the gluteus medius. Not so much for the gluteus minimus though, which is interesting. So I'll get back to that later, but you can see that roughly, regardless of which group you were in, whether you received artificial gravity or not, you everybody has accumulated the same amount of fat. So artificial gravity didn't actually affect how much fat was accumulated. Very interesting. So we can discuss these results and figure out why this was the case. Why is this so? Firstly, let's talk about the muscle atrophy, the muscle volume. Artificial gravity does not mitigate the muscle atrophy experience during microgravity. So let's get down to the bottom of this. Why did this happen? Was it the artificial gravity protocol itself? Was the duration too short? It was only 30 minutes a day. That's equivalent to being in bed for 23 and a half hours and then standing up for half an hour a day. Or was the load too weak? Was, it, was one GZ just not enough? Unfortunately, we couldn't spin the participants at any more any greater strength than 1G because then you start to develop um, presyncope or, or a faintness and people can get quite sick from from too strong of a force. Um, so 1G was the was the chosen dose. And this can probably be explained by the fact that our gluteal muscles are actually very strong. They are more accustomed to gener generating loads that are greater than 1G. So if you imagine standing, and doing nothing, not, not even taking a step, then your glutes are subject to a 1G force. As soon as you start walking or even running, our gluteal muscles are designed to cope with loads of up to 9G, just the muscle. Um, so that's, that's really interesting. The reason also that 1G was chosen was because 
lots of different research teams had a look at these participants. It wasn't just us with our gluteal muscles, but people were looking at the cardiovascular system and the neurovestibular system and, and all sorts of systems. And it has been shown in the past that systems like the cardiovascular system actually get rehabilitated um, at a 1G force. So artificial gravity works for the cardiovascular system at that dose, but not for the gluteal muscles. So the question is, is there a one size fits all solution for artificial gravity that will make all the systems and all the muscles happy? We don't know. It has been shown that resistive exercise during bed rest is effective. So is there a possibility that we could, we could combine artificial gravity with resistive exercise to get the best results for our gluteal muscles? Now, looking at the fat accumulation, how can we minimize this, this fatty muscle? We've shown that bed rest increases the fat accumulation in the gluteus maximus and medius, but artificial gravity does not have an effect. The difference in function can probably explain this. Gluteus maximus and medius are more torque producers. In other words, they are weight bearing muscles. They, they cope with the force that one has on earth or when they're running. Whereas gluteus minimus is more like a stabilizer. It keeps you still and balanced. So because gluteus maximus and medius weren't working as hard, it meant that they lost more. Whereas gluteus minimus was kind of just chilling there and it wasn't it, it wasn't really experiencing much loss because it didn't experience that that decreased axial loading like the others did this is the first investigation of the effect of artificial gravity on intramuscular lipid concentration no other study has actually considered fatty muscles as a determinant of function but it is actually a really really good one so perhaps in the future we should mri bed rest participants more often this is really relevant to a variety of people. Firstly, we like to look at astronauts. We want to know whether artificial gravity is going to be a good countermeasure for long duration space flight and perhaps target exercises for astronauts while in space so that they can maintain their muscle mass. But also, we like to have the same that we have, we like to transfer the knowledge that we get from these studies to terrestrial patients, people like uh, people who are elderly or disabled or have chronic illness or are bedridden can also benefit from this study. Because we can look at the effect of, of, of long term bed rest on patients and develop tailored exercises for hip rehabilitation and ultimately give them a greater quality of life. So it's not just for funding reasons that we like to apply space to earth, but it's it's for the good of all of humanity too. So what should we do in the future? We should look at artificial gravity regimens other than the one that we used. So perhaps a longer exposure, 30 minutes a day isn't that much when you consider it's just standing and, um, and exercising while, while spinning. So maybe that would actually help um, in the grand scheme of things. And we can also look at the spatial distribution of the accumulation of fat. In fact, it's been shown that the muscle fibers in gluteus maximus in the top part are different from the bottom part of the muscle. And so they would probably accumulate fat differently. So from an academic perspective and a functional perspective, maybe it would be useful to actually separate the muscles into individual parts themselves. And we can look at a greater sample size. We only had 24 participants and that probably wasn't enough to make any solid conclusions. So we need to do more bed rest studies. There is one being planned at the moment in Slovenia and it's been approved to go ahead this year, but the more bed rest studies and artificial gravity studies we do, the better. So back to my lay title of my presentation, what do beds, butts and the blue Danube have in common? We've talked about beds. And I've talked about butts for sure. And well, the Blue Danube is the soundtrack to my favorite space movie, 2001 A Space Odyssey. And there's a special scene where it's showing all the spacecraft um, floating gracefully through the vacuum of space. And one in particular is a space hotel that happens to be a centrifuge. So perhaps Stanley Kubrick was right. And perhaps we will need centrifuges in space. This one's just a lot bigger than the one that we used. So when I see that scene, I think of the Blue Danube. 
So let's face it, more and more people are going to go to space for longer periods of time and a diverse range of people too. So when we land on a surface like the moon or Mars or back to Earth, then astronauts need to have the mobility and the muscle strength to cope with emergencies and to deal with them in the first 24 hours. But in that first 24 hours, that is when they're most vulnerable. So in order to be productive and functional and safe to deal with an emergency, they need to have the right muscle strength. And so whether artificial gravity is going to be a good countermeasure and solution for muscle atrophy and muscle deconditioning in space remains to be seen. I'd like to acknowledge the supervisors of my research project, Professor Cable, Professor Hydes, Nick, Enrico and Jim, and my beloved mentors, Dr. Philpot, Dr. Christensen and Dr. Gooden. This QR code will lead you to my paper, which is published in Frontiers of Physiology. And I designed a mission patch for my research. I had a lot of fun with that. And I have the physical version right here. So if you would like one, chuck me an email. My email address is down below and I would be happy to mail you one. Thank you very much for listening to my talk and I would welcome any questions. Thanks. Thank you. That was uh, absolutely fantastic. We've got a whole bunch of people here ready to ask questions. I need to come get to come up to the microphone so be anyone here. This is Len. Hi, Len. Hi, Len. Hi, Vienna. Len Halperin here. Um, a lot of questions. First of all, I'm interested that you mentioned 2001 because my question was relating to that and there's another sequence there on the mission to Jupiter where you see I think it was 40 feet diameter for memory the rotating space station on board Discovery and you see an astronaut running around there now he's obviously loading in the z direction but there are three astronauts in hibernation and they're not loading in the z direction and we spend a third of our lives not loading in the z direction are our muscles atrophying during that stage Are you asking whether our muscles atrophy during sleep? Yes. Well, evolution has done a very good job in ensuring that the eight hours that we spend a day sleeping does not affect the amount of atrophy that we get. Now, if a patient stays in bed for a week, that's very different, but human beings are very, very used to being flat for eight hours a day. And so that's not going to affect us. Which leads to my next question. The Apollo missions were about eight to 12 days. And um, their workloads on the moon are enormous. They said their heart rates went up. And that even on Apollo 15, they suspect that Jim Irwin may have had a cardiac event that ultimately may have led to his early demise. So is eight to 12 days enough to do the atrophy? And is um, the fact that they're working in reduced gravity, does that mean that other muscles step in to compensate for the goods? Or is the brain overcompensating? What's going on with the body? What causes the extreme workload? So let's say we, t we take an, an eight day mission, right? Um, is, this is an eight day mission from earth to the moon and then back to earth again. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Okay. Um, there has been a study on Mir, a space station, and uh, that was a 14 day mission and there was a 7% loss in the gluteus maximus. So even after two weeks there, there are losses seen in very, very fit, healthy, well-selected astronauts. Um, now, when they get back to Earth, it's actually not very much work to rehabilitate them to a normal state, but and, and that's fine, but they get back to a controlled environment. When we send people for six months to Mars and they land and they're very vulnerable in that first 24 hours, then that's where we get really concerned. Um, yeah, so when if you're asking about the Apollo astronauts, I'm not sure if it was, if you, if you take everything together and how all the body systems are affected, for example, the fluid shift that goes from the legs to the, the head and the chest during microgravity, that is proportionally a greater effect. It has a greater effect on the astronaut, as well as the big bulky suit that doesn't have very much range of motion. That would affect the astronauts' well-being and productivity more than just a little bit of gluteal muscle atrophy. All right, thanks. Thanks.
Well, then somebody else came up to the microphone. His name's Shane. I've got a question after Shane. Okay. Hi, V. How are you doing? Hi. Um, I was wondering, you know, yeah. I was wondering, um, are you familiar with the Institute of Biomedical Problems um, similar experiment where they're in, I guess, a, a bath of cushions? Um, I'm, I'm not sure about cushions, but there, there is another version of bed rest study called dry immersion, where they'll basically, they'll, for those who don't know, it's, it's a swimming pool with a piece of tarp on it and you put the person on the tarp. And so the swimming pool acts as that buoyancy so that the person is in that neutral buoyancy position and not having any um, GZ force. So that dry motion is another version of um, um, microgravity analogs. Um, we didn't look at those specifically in our research, but what was your question? Um, it, it sort of relates to um, whether that is a better simulant of um, zero G, even though bed rest and that are both poor simulants because you're still getting the acceleration. Um, what do you think the, the, uh, the best way to uh, simulate that might be here on uh, in our terrestrial conditions? It's really, really difficult. If if we knew the best way, then we would have already done it. Now, in terms of dry immersion, it I think dry immersion has the advantage that you are actually in that that flexed position with your hips flexed and your knees flexed, um, and so it feels like you're floating, um, and so it would be more of an accurate representation of how you'd be floating on a space station. However, um, it has its own disadvantages. It restricts the movement of the participants, so it becomes extremely uncomfortable. Um, and it overall is only accurate for a few days at a time, whereas bed rest studies, you can go for 60 days. The problem with bed rest studies is that um, you're still using your glutes in bed. You're still kind of moving around. You can roll, you can move your legs sort of horizontally. Um, so there is still movement and work being done in other directions. Um, so neither, neither analog is accurate. Um, so we, we take what we can get when it comes to analogs. Thanks for that. Um, you might talk to Anastasia Stefanova. I think, um, uh, Jonathan Clark has been in contact with her. She's in the U S at the moment, just starting a PhD. I think she spent a few weeks in that kind of configuration. I'd love to speak to her. Thanks, Shane. Good to see you. I see him everywhere. <laughs> oh, that right? So, Vienna, I might have a, have a few questions, so I hope you be patient with me. Um, are you familiar with James Waldy's uh, compression suit, artificial compression? Is, is that any bearing on what you're studying? I mean, I know you're focusing on the glute muscles. Um, I guess his is more related to triceps and quadriceps and those types of things. Is that correct, along the muscles? Yeah, that's correct. He, um, his compression suit is, I, fr from what I remember, um, he, that's a countermeasure to fluid shift. So our, our fluid shift goes from it, it in our microgravity, we've got fluid traveling from the legs to the head and the neck. And that, that compression suit is, it's both meant, meant to be countermeasuring that, but also muscle atrophy and bone atrophy. I'm just not sure if it will be sufficient in itself to mitigate the losses because our glutes are very strong, as I said, and th there's no suit that you can wear that's going to put your glutes under the same amount of force as we do on earth, unless we have extremely, extremely heavy lead suits with very, very, you know, elaborate, elaborate um, equipment. So I think that is part of the solution, but the other thing is that that's passive. When we wear a suit, say, say if you put weights in your legs and you walk around or you, you, you use a vibrator machine like what was popular in the 80s, that's, you're, you're sitting there or you're standing there letting something else do the work for you. You're not having any neural, neuromuscular input from your brain to your muscle telling it to do the work. And you actually need that neuromuscular input to build muscle volume. So. I, this is why I think exercise is going to be part of the solution still. We cannot eliminate exercise completely. We need passive and active movement. Okay, this sounds probably a really bad question. But late night TV, they have these things that advertised where they you put them on your muscles and they provide electrical stimulation to muscles. 
does that have any benefit for I don't know if that's been studied for, for for astronauts. I don't know if it's been studied for even Earth-based patients and been proven, because if we could all use electrical currents to keep our muscles strong and healthy, then we wouldn't have so many weak people in bed and so many sedentary people getting sick. Um, I like, like I said before, there needs to be neuromuscular input from the central nervous system to the muscle and the muscle responds to that. And that's what most effectively builds our muscle fibers. Um, fantastic. Yeah, and the other thing I was thinking about is people in comatose situations, are you, I mean, obviously you can't even see all the family's consent, but are they a good database of knowledge for you to study deterioration? That's a really good question. The, the reason that we choose healthy participants is that we want to study them in a very controlled environment where they don't have pre-existing medical conditions and we can measure the degradation in muscle um, from a healthy, good baseline. Because we're not, firstly, we're not sending sick people to space before we send healthy people to space. And we want to be able to control these results so that we know that uh, our 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 independent variable is really the thing that is affecting the dependent variable rather than having pre-existing medical conditions affect our results. So we really need to isolate what's going on. Fantastic. Thank you. How did you go uh, with that complimentary in your top one? Beautiful. <laughs> um, Ian Johnson. Hello, testing. Oh, we've got uh, uh, interplanetary visitor joining us. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I guess I guess uh, using humans is quite a timely. It takes a long time to test these subjects, and you don't get many of them. So, are there any other models that you can use that are appropriate? Is there any animal or or other model? You can certainly use mouse models. So we can use in vivo mouse models. There have actually been very interesting studies of hind limb suspension in mice where you get you get your mouse right and you take the hind limbs and you put them up in a little sling and you just sit them there. And that that is also decreasing the axial loading on those hind limbs, on the mouse glutes. So they have shown some really promising results in the fact that obviously their glutes will decrease and that their glutes will become weaker when you hind limb suspend them. Um, but we can also do in vitro models with, with um, say, um, organs on a chip, for example. There have been organ cells and organelles sent to space on, on a little chip this big to the International Space Station to study the effect on the cellular level. And that can give us a lot of information as well. So I think both studies complement each other, but ultimately we want to know what happens in the human being. Of course, yeah. Mm. So would you consider that there would be a, pharmac a pharmacological therapeutic, or is this going to really have to be uh, that you've got to do exercise? I think exercise is always going to be part of the solution. We, we can't get rid of that, unfortunately. I'm sorry to say for people who want to go to space, but you're going to have to do exercise, <laughs> in my view. Um, pharmacological, uh, I wish, you know, wouldn't it be nice if there was a magic pill for to solve everything? For muscles, there isn't a pill that will build your muscle. That that's, doesn't exist. There is a pill that will increase the rate of bone formation. Um, it's not a pill, in fact, it's an injection called Prolia or denosumab, and that helps with osteoporosis patients on earth. And it's been proposed in a study by yours truly that um, it, uh, it can help with astronauts in space for long periods of time. So bones, perhaps, but to answer your question, no drugs for your muscles. Okay. We'll have to work on that. Thank you. Thanks. I know a pharmaceutical solution. It's actually not the pill, it's the container thing. It's about 16 kilograms, and you have to lift it up and undo the top. So, things do. Um, any other questions from the uh, Zoomosphere or in the room? No? Well, thank you, uh, Vienna. Really appreciate you coming back and uh, giving us an update. Fantastic. Um, have you got follow up studies now with this, or are you getting back to your day job? or 
Uh, well, I, I do have a day job, but I'm hoping to contribute to the study in Slovenia. It will be a very, very similar one, but they'll be, I believe they'll be testing exercise, resistive exercise at the same time. They'll also be planning some um, exercises for the back. So the back muscles also suffer in space. In fact, astronauts do complain of back pain and there have been shown to be losses in the back muscles during bed rest, which what? is really important because it's what? very... It's that's okay. Um, the back does a lot of things for us. Um, it stops us from, you know, collapsing and it keeps us upright and it allows us to respond quickly um, during emergencies. So these are other muscles that are being studied at the moment. So hopefully we can get to the point where we can decide whether artificial gravity is needed or not. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your really appreciate it. So thank you for being here. Okay, well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're going to continue with the rest of the meeting. Um, well, the end of the meeting. Um, we've now got a space science news report from Andrew Rennie, who's uh, come back to the meeting here. And um, I hand over to Andrew. Thank you. All right, greetings, everyone. Now, I had intended to start with an audio, but I see the PowerPoint's up, so we'll do that first. Now, no, don't worry, Ash, we'll do it afterwards, okay? Yeah. All right, get myself organised. Now, Space science news, and let's see. No. Oh, use the pen. It's all right. Good. Right. Our Parker Solar Pro recently went past Venus, and uh, amazingly, it can see through the clouds of sulfuric acid. And that dark shape you see there is Aphrodite Terra. There is a movie of it going past as well, which I was going to show, but it uh, won't. And uh, these little flashes here is the solar wind, the electrons in the solar wind. All right. So there's another of the pictures of the Parker as it went past Venus and those dark and dark and bright areas. Can you see my cursor? No, you can't. All right. 
So many things. Good one. There's a few times when I want to use the pure set. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, yes, so you can see there the, the light and dark shades is what um, the Parker could see as it did a flyby of Venus. The idea of flying past Venus to get gravity assist in order to get closer and closer to the sun. And so I'm just trying to work out which of these. <laughs> advances the slide. Arrow, I'm, I'm using an arrow and nothing happens. Oh, now it has. Okay, so it's been a long time since we had missions to Venus. And these are three that are under planning Veritas, Da Vinci, and Envision. The Envision is the European Space Agency, the other two are NASA ones. So Veritas is going to do some gravity science by tracking. It has a Venus emissivity mapper, which is measuring the radiation coming from the planet. And it also has an interferometric, interferometric synthetic aperture radar. <laughs> and it's much, much more detailed than what was happened with Magellan many years ago. So what are we trying to find out? Well, what processes shape the rocky planet evolution? How has Venus changed over the years? Does it have plate tectonics, for example? Are these activities still going on on Venus? And was there water on Venus in the past or even in the present somewhere on, on that planet? Da Vinci is a probe that's going to land on the planet and make movies on the way down, and it's going to do analyses of the gas on the way down. It's due to drop into the planet on 2031. It is a list of the instrumentation. I'm not going to read through them all, but the top two that I've highlighted in blue, I have a presentation here, courtesy un unasked, by one of the scientists involved. Meanwhile, the uh, Envision mission, the European Space Agency one, has those instruments aboard, and again has synthetic aperture radar, which is going to give quite good resolution. Be Magellan only got resolution down to about 100 meters or so, whereas this is going to down to 10 or 30 meter altimetry data. Okay, now, what do we want to find out about the atmosphere of Venus? Melissa Trainer uh, has done this presentation, which I've stolen from her, and, it, and I've edited it down to a small size. And we're gonna be looking uh, at the noble gases, <laughs> helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon. Krypton, of course, is the one that does in Superman. So why, why are noble gases important? What do we already know about the noble gases on Venus? How are we going to get measurements? And what are the challenges? So by finding out about these gases, 
the only traces of them in the atmosphere, we'll find out about the origin of the atmosphere of Venus and how that atmosphere has changed over the years. And how and why is Venus different from Earth and Mars? And as I said, was there an early ocean on Venus? There is some evidence there might have been. If Venus hasn't always been the red hot planet it is today. So just to remind you that Venus is a terrestrial planet, but it's about the same size as the Earth and certainly a lot bigger than Mars. Now, where did the atmosphere come from? Well, it's accretion. And you can get the original nebula from which the solar system was formed. Comets bring in water uh, and gases, you know, atmosphere, and chondrites do as well. And also outgassing from the interior of the planet, the volcanic gases, in other words. And atmosphere is lost to space, mainly swept away by the solar wind. And also there are surface sinks. For example, on Earth, we get lots and lots of carbonates, you know, the white cliffs of Dover. Uh, it came from the atmosphere. So what forces controlled atmospheric evolution? Well, there are four, four of them here, and we'll go through each of them in turn quickly. Hydrodynamic escape. Um, the terrestrial planets lost their noble gases to blow off of the atmospheric hydrogen by extreme ultraviolet uh, or by formation of the moon. You know, when the Sia, I think it's called, slammed into the earth and threw off the moon, we lost a lot of gas that way. So the things have changed over the time. Impacts during accretion would lead to mass independent fractionation. Fractionation is the separation of the various elements. And we have delivery from comets bringing in these noble gases. And we have charged hydrodynamics. Now xenon, for example, is easily ionized by the hydrogen minus molecule in the solar wind. Okay, so is Venus similar to the Earth in the way that these volatiles have come to the planet and left the planet? If there was an early ocean, what was the timing of it? And when did the water leave if there was water there? And there is some theories quite a bit of evidence for it, in fact, that the whole of Venus's surface turned upside down, overturned, and resurfaced the whole planet, which is why it looks so uh, volcanic and rocky today. So to sort all that out, his scientists pulling their hair out. Ah. So what are the challenges that uh, the Veritas mission is going to do, sorry, the Da Vinci probe, sorry, is going to do. It has to measure those gases very precisely. But the problem is, where do you measure? At the top of the atmosphere, in the middle, or at the bottom? It's easiest to measure it at the top because it gets harder and harder to get down near the surface of the planet. But that's what Veritas is going to try and do. Um, so Da Vinci is trying, going to try and do. All right. Now, there's a problem. If you try and measure, say, neon, neon 20, well, you're going to have mass channel 20 looking at that, but there's other things that can be confused with neon, argon, and the water with isotope 18 of oxygen. Neon 22, again, can be confused with carbon dioxide, and argon can be confused with hydrogen chloride, hydrochloric acid, 
And argon 38 can be confused with the isotope of 37 of chlorine or hydrogen chloride. So it's a very confusing problem that this pro project hopes to sort out. All right, now let's change the, change the topic now to orbital debris. Uh, this paper was published in September last year in the Orbital Debris Quarterly News, and I'll pinched some things out of it. And what we've got here is the monthly effective number of objects in Earth orbit from 1956 or 57, if you like, until 2020. Now, the scale at the bottom, I converted this from a PDF file into a PowerPoint, and as a result, um, I couldn't size those up, the, the dates on there, so they don't quite match the columns. Now, I've added some marks to this. The asterisk, Fenyong 1C, that sudden jump that you see at the first asterisk there, uh, which is here, okay, that's when at the China did an anti-satellite test. They destroyed a weather satellite called Fenyong 1C uh, with the anti-satellite test, and suddenly the amount of debris went up. Boom. Then, in uh, February 10th of 2009, Cosmos 2252 and Iridium 33 collided, and bam, up went the amount of debris and space again. You'll notice that there are a few places where the amount of debris drops, and here and here. And I've looked at the sun's, yeah, you know, the solar cycle and solar maximum, and I've marked in on this on this graph these points with these surflexes, where the solar maximum was. And you see that at the, many of those, there's a drop in the number of objects. This line is the low Earth orbit one, which is the worrying one. The other ones are at high altitude orbits. All right, let's go on. This is the monthly mass of objects in Earth orbit, not the number, but the mass of material in Earth orbit. And again, you'll see that we get a drop here with one of the solar maximum, another drop here, uh, but the mass just keeps on growing. And this only goes to 2020, by the way. The OECD is now considering the problem, and uh, their paper uh, has done an economic analysis of the issue of space debris. What, how are we going to control it? What financial things can we bring to bear on it? There are a number of challenges. Uh, LEO has become even more crowded due to the growth of population of functional satellites mainly for commercial activities. And it's interesting to note that the growth in amateur launches since 2000, when uh, this refers mainly to very small educational satellites, CubeSats in other words. Now, look here. This uh, blue area are defense satellites, big bulbs during the Cold War. Then after the end of the Cold War, the number drops to, well, we don't, need, we don't need as many satellites. Plus, of course, the satellites are living longer and doing more things. So you need fewer of them. The commercial satellites, hardly any until around about um, the mid 1990s. And then whoosh, suddenly we've got them going here in the, yeah, and this only goes to 2019, this particular chart. Since then, it's gone even higher. All right. So there's the total number of satellites that were in orbit in 2019, at the end of 2019. This is not have been in orbit, but they are actually in orbit, functional satellites. So these are the operational ones, not the dead ones, not the junk. And uh, you can see that the... Uh, United States has uh, you know, the most number of satellites, followed by China and the Russian Federation. And do those numbers that you down to about, say, CubeSat size, not nuts and bolts or 
No, no, no. This particular table here is operational satellites. Yeah, but down to a certain size. Yeah, well, a paint flag is an operational satellite. So, uh, so it's, it's not. This is not just the. This is not the debris. This is not this used satellite. This, this is the actual one still operating at that time. Okay. Um, between 2015 and 2020, more than 900 CubeSats have been launched into low Earth orbit. And this chart here tracks that number up to the end of 2020. Right. So that, that number suddenly whoosh, it's gone up. Now, the problem here is that many CubeSats do not carry propulsion, either because the, there's not enough room on the satellite to, to put propulsion on it, or because the launch providers say, no, no, no way you're not putting any rocket power or anything on, on, our, on our rocket. So we're only going to carry you if you're a dead, inert object. Okay. And so that's uh, problematic for debris mitigation. Uh, as CubeSats, and especially in the higher orbits, they can't actively deorbit. And they can't carry out avoidance maneuvers by and large. Come to that as an exception to that in a moment. Now, here's the amount of debris now. Now we're looking at the trapped debris. This is only trapped debris. This is by NORAD. Okay. Uh, not by any other people who can also track stuff. And we see that uh, rocket bodies, there's quite a few of them, but other debris, there's huge numbers, amount of other debris in space. Now, what about getting rid, getting stuff out of space? The blue on this, up here, blue, no attempt to get things out of space. No attempt to think. The darker blue, there is insufficient. They tried, but it wasn't sufficient to do anything worthwhile. And the green are the successful attempts to remove the objects from space. Okay. And you can see that. There's been a slight increase in the in the successful removal, but not a great deal. Still, the vast majority of objects, there's no attempt to remove them from, from orbit. There's another problem, and that operators sometimes just ignore the warnings. There's close to 20,000 pieces of debris currently catalogued and tracked by the United States Air Force. And it's deemed to represent only about, as Len has said, about 0.02% of the total estimated debris population. Now, the deployment of the space fence will improve the situation, but not resolve it, as it will increase the number of catalogued objects, but not the observational accuracy. And space tracking organizations entirely rely on the cooperation of space operators to identify space objects. And we've had this situation here in Australia, when our, even uh, late last year, Australian satellites were launched into space and NORAD had no idea which was which. And then the people who put them up, the universities had to tell NORAD, uh, this one's ours, that one is, is theirs, <laughs> and after a few months, it ended in the catalog. But it relied on the operators to say, hey, this is our one, because the one CubeSat to NORAD looks just like another. All right, let's go on. Collision avoidance processes are currently manual or ad hoc. And there's one example in the OECD report, uh, which I'd heard about before, in September of 2019, low Earth orbit incident involving a European Space Agency satellite, Aeolus, and a Spacelink 44 satellite. And the Spacelink had been lowered to near 320 kilometers so they could conduct some deorbit tests. Now, the Spacelinks are an exception. They do have thrusters on them, 
and ion thrusters, plasma thrusters, and they can alter their orbit. Well, the United States Air Force told Spacelink and they told ESA, the European Space Agency, hey, these two satellites could collide. You better do something about it. Well, ESA I changed its orbit of, of ALIS to avoid the collision, but so did Spacelink. And they were supposed to be talking to each other. And it turns out what Spacelink says, whether it's true or not, SpaceX, find the cursor here, there it is. SpaceX has later communicated that a communications bug prevented the Starlink operator from seeing the correspondence with a probability increase. In other words, they didn't, they, they weren't able to talk to each other properly. All right, moving on quickly with, um, how do you do something about this? Do you use taxes or voluntary efforts? or a fee, do you charge a fee? Do you have tradable permits? And so on. And these are down here, various things that governments need to look after or encourage change in. And what do we do to the satellites? Do we, how do we, do we tax the satellite operators? Do we, what do we do? Well, that's just, these are the instruments that are used in other areas. What would be used in space? Well, we'd have to figure that out. Right, moving on. China's space program. They have published earlier this year, in January, a, a plan, a five-year plan. This is, I think, their fifth space one they've had. And in it, they look back, back at what they've done the last five years and look forward to the next five years. So here's, I've pulled out some extracts from the plan and uh, the high yarn uh, has been used to, to um, observe black hole explosion processes. The Wukong Explorer uh, defined the energy structure of the uh, cosmic rays. Uh, Zhang Heng won built models for the global geomagnetic field. You've probably never heard of that, but there have been satellites measuring the magnetic field. Uh, the tran no, sorry, TANSAT developed a high precision map of the worldwide distribution of carbon dioxide. So obviously looking at global warming. Uh, lunar exploration missions revealed the subsurface structure of the moon's far side, confirming that there were still mag magnetic, say mag, Magmatic activities, that's um, magma, on the moon two billion years ago. And uh, they also reported that Tianquan 1 and Taji 1 and Zihi provided new research methods regarding space gravitational waves. Probably you haven't heard of that. And solar physics. Now, Again, a quote from the report, in the following five years, China's space industry will continue to follow the guidance of Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics of a new era. <laughs> and it made me think when I heard uh, ScoMo the other day uh, saying, ScoMo thought, we are an astronaut nation, he said. And it's also about putting Australians in space, working with NASA and other international partners. And he said that on Friday. And then as Peter showed us before, that's a picture of him there at the Australian Space Agency in Adelaide on Friday. All right, back to China. In the next five years, China will build the space station, continue building it, uh, build the high resolution Earth observing system implement new major projects, including the fourth phase of the lunar exploration program and planetary exploration, promote the research and development of heavy lift vehicles, look at the risk from asteroids, and 
develop essential programs such as the boundary exploration of the solar system. Not sure what they quite they mean by the by that. And they're going to further expand the launch vehicle family. So they've got uh, quite a few long march vehicles already. And uh, there's some private companies also developing rockets. And so they're going to expand the launch vehicle family. So critical areas that China sees in the next five years is space astronomy, space physics, lunar and planetary science, and space earth sciences. And uh, they're going to do a satellite called the Einstein probe to detect gravitational waves. Uh, it sounds a bit like the European Space Agency's LISA mission. And uh, they're also going to do an advanced space-based solar observatory. They've re recently launched one. Okay. And they're going to carry on with the space station and uh, do lunar uh, and deep space programs. This is Lee, Louis Zhu. Jeez, sorry, Louis Gizong, who's the director of lunar exploration at the Space Program Center at the China National Space Agency. And this is an exact quote from the talk, the press conference they had announcing this thing. Uh, <clears throat> he says that we've gained a new understanding of the evolution of the moon. And it turns out that the moon, he says, is approximately 1 billion years younger. He means younger than previously thought in terms of geological activity. Not the actual moon is younger, but the activity, he meant the, year, the activity on the moon is younger. All right. He says that we discovered new types of lunar matter of deep seated origin through preliminary studies and the relatively precise fine structure of cosmic ray energy spectrum. Now, New types of lunar matter. I'm not quite sure what he means by that. I think he means the new geological structures that they've found by sounding down below the surface. Um, he also said that, well, you can see that there, we've discovered lunar micromagnetosphere. So the moon does have some magnetic field, but uh, not much. Zhejian described the Zenhe solar satellite and uh, gave details on how many um, observations he had made at the time. That's a, that is, in, um, it was only launched in October last year and this he's reporting in January of this year. So that satellite continues to make observations. I haven't seen any pictures taken by it though. I haven't seen the data yet, but he says it has done pictures. All right. And it's one particular thing it's doing is looking at the hydrogen alpha spectrum of the sun. And uh, he, he, they say it's the first time that's been done from space. Looking to the future, the Chong'e series of probes, Chong'e 6, We'll collect samples. And he says more valuable areas of the moon and return home. By that he means that the south pole of the moon. Chang'e 7 is expected to conduct further exploration of the polar regions and work out where the water is on the, on the south pole of the moon. And don't go into the South Pole because that's where most of the water is. There's some at the North Pole, but not much, not as much. And Chang'e 8 will continue to explore the polar regions and work towards that research station that they're going to set up with Russia. Now, the Chang'e uh, 8 mission will be researched, to, you know, prepared. And but won't launch until 2030, which is in the next five year plan after this one. So here's a summary of their lunar and planetary missions that they're planning over the next few years. All right, let's go on. Uh, look, I'm gonna skip through these. I've spent a lot of time preparing this, but the details on some of their missions. You, they've got a, a, a a data system that you can access and download the images. And this is, this is I took this from, a, from their description of what is available. 
Now this was published in uh, Nature Switzerland, the Nature you know, Science magazine in uh, November last year. So they say that uh, the landing camera system uh, took, oh, I haven't put the number in there. Uh, it de describes how many pictures are in the database system. Let's go on. Uh, the panoramic camera um, has a spectral range of 420 to 700 nanometers. And uh, it takes color and panchromatic. Panchromatic means black and white to you and I. And it can take, interestingly, it can take um, images at a frame rate of up to five per second. So it's almost like doing slow motion movies. The Lunar Mineralogical Spectrometer uh, is, is, can do things there. And uh, it has a penetrating radar. And there's the products that are available and how many of them are available. So you can just go into the website and get those pictures if you want them. Now, Tianwen One Orbiter, by the way, it was called Huazing One before it was launched. And they gave it the Tianwen One after the launch. And the Xerong One, which is the rover, has those instruments. And once again, um, as of November last year, these were, there are 372 images in their database that you could get from the moderate resolution and 132 high res pictures and 296 of probe targets on the Martian surface. It's penetrating uh, the surface with a radar and looking at the minerals. And you get a, a, a data cube like that, which I won't have time to describe what a data cube is, but it's a different spectra, different um, directions. It's also monitoring the uh, shallow surface structure from both the orbiter and from the rover. Now, Mars water. Where's it gone? Where is it? Well, this paper was published in Science in uh, March of 2021. And this paper addresses where did the water go and when did it go? And has traces and so on of where it went from volcanism to atmosphere, lost into space, hit, you know, frozen into the polar ice caps and so on. And uh, skip that one. And it, it analyzes various models for, okay, if, if, this, if these conditions were so, this is how it would have happened. But if that condition is different, then what would be different? And they're trying to match the models with reality. So, okay. Now, remember the talk Kerry Doherty gave us on uh, females in space? Well, I think she might have just in this paper, which is published by in, um, the Journal of Women's Health last year, I think it was. And it, they look at how did, uh, how does gender affect the reactions of the body to space? I have picked out of that report just a few interesting things because the whole report would take me you know, till tomorrow to, to describe. So we've got six differences in the demographic and mission demographic and mission factors. So this is looking from 1998 to 2013. So it's almost you know, like nine years ago, up to nine years ago. How many people went to the space station? What were the gender balance and things like that? So there were a total of 201 astronauts and cosmonauts who traveled to the space station, 30 females or 15% of the people and 171 males or 
there were no duration differences for the US astronauts who transited the US the space station. Transited means they went up, stayed up for a day or two or more, six months or whatever, then came down. Now, here's the graphs that are interesting. How long do people stay on the space station? Well, the vast majority up that time were there for less than 40 days. Most of these people were shuttle astronauts that went up there um, and, and did, a, you know, seven days on the space station and came back down. But you see the gender balance there, the black is the males and the blue are the females. This one is for all nationalities. And here's the interesting thing that I, it surprised me a little, the age distribution. Now, if you are less than about 35 years of age, you can just about forget the idea of going to the space station. Okay, so if you're only a 20 year old and you want to go to the space station, forget it. You've got to wait another 15 years. <laughs> Likewise, uh, if like me, you are over 55 years of age, uh, again, you can pretty much forget about going to the space station because it just ain't going to happen. The median age, as you can see there, for females was 42.5 years. And the, um, for males, it was 44 years. So that's uh thing. You remember John Glenn? He was thought to be ancient during the Mercury days. He was 40 years old, for heaven's sakes. Fancy that, putting a 40-year-old in space? After all, Titov had only been 24 years old when he went up. He's Russian. <laughs> well, and here's the distribution of astronauts and cosmonauts for all transits of the space station after 2013. And again, you can see the average age, the median age uh, is 43 years for females and 46 for males. And this is for the first turn. And uh, this is, see that previous statistic includes people who've been up there several times, okay? But this is for the first time. The first time you go on the space station, the youngest person has been 35 years of age. Okay. So I'll point out this again, it's only up to 2013. And there was one 56 year old female. All right, just the one. All right, now, The Tonga explosion mentioned earlier, but you may not realize when you've seen that video going you know, from Himawari 8, that those pictures were taken at 10 minute intervals. 10 minute intervals. You can look at the timestamp on those, you can't see them on the screen here, it's a bit blurred. But those are 10 minute intervals. That thing went wow, enormously fast. Okay. James Webb Space Telescope. That's the first picture they released. It's actually a mosaic of um, you know, put together from the 18 different mirrors. And when you look at that, when you've seen it, you say, yeah, oh, yeah, okay, a few blurry spots. Well, the interesting thing is if you enlarge it, well, no, not enlarge it, just display it at full size on your computer monitor. And that's what you see when you see it at full size. Except I've only picked out two of the two of those images. There are 18 images there because the mirrors are all sort of skewed at different angles. And what they're doing now is aligning those to bring them all into one image. Beautiful diffraction pattern there. I love it. I love seeing interference patterns, uh, diffraction patterns, sorry. And um, so it's diffraction limited. All right. Now they said there are no cameras on the on the telescope. Yeah, you know, I, I had press conference after press conference at the time of the launch. 
oh, are we going to see it unfolding and so on? And I said, no, there's no camera on board that can take photographs of it. It would just add to the, there was no point because everything was going to be in the shade from the sun shield. And so it would be dark anyway. And it would just mean cameras and cabling and complexity that they would be of no use. Well, it turned out, yeah. <laughs> Take away one of the lenses and peering through off the secondary mirror, here is, the, here is a selfie of the thing. So nice surprise. They said there wasn't going to be any way they could do anything like that. And yes, they are. They could. By the way, the bright one there is because that particular mirror is pointing at a star. And so it's a lot brighter. So this is in starlight. This is in starlight. All right. Now, just quickly, artwork. Lots of space program things have art built into their program. They have artists come along, resident, artists and residents and so on. And these are a few pictures of it, or artist impressions of the James Webb Space Telescope. And there are hundreds of these, by the way, and I've only picked out about four of them. Now, moving on. Oh, well, all right. time finished, time to finish, just about quickly then. Um, the New Horizons spacecraft. You can see where it is in relation to the others that are heading out of the solar system. And Arakoth has now got three names. Sky, Akasa, and Ka'an. And uh, they are both with a sky theme. All those names in different languages mean sky. So there's uh, some new features on Arakoth. Also, Remember when uh, New Horizons went past Pluto? There's part of Pluto was in uh, darkness, and we said, okay, well, we're never going to see that side during our lifetime because no one's going to send a spacecraft out there again in, in our lifetime. Well, turns out that the night side was lit by Sharon shine, light reflecting, sunlight reflecting of Sharon onto Pluto's dark side. And They've just put on their website this photograph showing Sharon. So this is Pluto. The white area all around here is the atmosphere. So it's sunlight shining through the atmosphere. And this is the dark side of Pluto that we thought we'd never see. And we can see some features there in Sharon's side. Okay. Oh. Oh, yes, that works. So you can see there that gives you the geographic coordinates and this animated GIF. I'll just let it sit there for a moment. And we're just coming up near the end of our talk. Now, Bessie Coleman, Aviatrix, 1922. Sally Ride, 1980s, an astronaut. Well, both of them have been honored with names on Pluto. There's the Ride Rupees and Coleman Mons. And uh, that shows where they are. So that's uh, just been done recently, naming those features on Pluto. Now, okay, art. Let's go back into the art again. And uh, this is artworks related to Pluto. And this is a view, an, an artist's impression of what it'd be like to be in Sputnik Planitia, near the boundary of Sputnik Planitia. And in the future, we may even get astronauts sitting on Pluto, the family group there, mum, dad, and their child, looking up at Sharon in the sky. And yes, we've got some atmosphere there as well. And another view looking towards the sun in the distance. And we've got Sharon uh, high in the sky above Pluto's surface. Okay. So. 
Okay. Now, I just want to do one more thing. Let's take a few seconds. If I can just escape out of that. And could you play me that file? I, I'm going to play you an audio that I recorded at a quarter past six this afternoon or this evening. I have for some, well, since uh, mid late January, been trying to contact the, Aust the Australian Space Agency. And I've sent emails and I'll phone their phone numbers. And at quarter past six, this is the message that you get if you ring the Australian Space Agency. Could you play that audio file, please? Contacting the Australian Space Agency, this inbox will be unmonitored for the period from the 25th of December through to the 3rd of January 2022. All inquiries will be responded to after this date. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Record your message at the tone. When you are finished, hang up or press pound for more So, uh, and then we're going to put a question on space. <laughs> Andrew, I think you may have broken some federal law there by recording at a government agency on a telegraphic service. Oh, 